question. First of all, I want to thank you for that. Um, there are very few young women, certainly the, the women in their 20s that are coming just to intern and assist me, who knew that there was a time when women didn't <laughs> direct professionally and did not have these opportunities. So it's so nice to hear that you do know, because there was some hard times <laughs> making it happen. Um, I didn't have the wonderful experience that so many younger people have now, I think the new word for the 21st century is mentor. Um, I'm mentoring a lot of people. I didn't ever have a mentor. I never had someone who took me on and championed me and helped me along. Uh, I think it's a wonderful thing to do, and um, I think I'm doing it with so many talented people because I want to give them what I didn't have. Um, so when you ask me who my heroes were, um, it depends on which hat I'm wearing. Mm -hmm. If I'm wearing my artistic director hat, I would say Zelda Fitchhandler at the United States, one of the great, great pioneers. Um, I would say Joseph Pat for all of his Michigas. He <laughs> was so fabulous and so dedicated and believed in new work and believed in risky work and believed in telling the stories that matter in this world, no matter what the cost. Uh, he also took on some of the worst critics of our day, and he just, you know, he, Charlene Woodard was uh, just here, and she was talking about a friend of ours who's a real warrior, and she was doing all of these things. Well, Joe Papp was a real warrior, too. And I loved that about him, and I loved he did what he believed in with a huge vision. Um, and I guess Lloyd Richards, because Lloyd championed <coughs> Um, the work of African-American artists, um, first director to direct Lorraine Hansberry on Broadway, and he himself, I think, was the first African-American director, if I'm correct, on Broadway. Maybe I'm wrong. One of the earliest, though, if not the first. And then when he ran at the Yale School of Drama, all the work he did with August uh, Wilson, and then not only people of color, but also he championed the work of women and, um, and all really talented young, young voices. So I just, I love that about him. Um, if it comes to playwrights, the list is kind of too long. I mean, it's almost the list of the people who are coming to this conference. 
except for I'm supposed to be have a meeting uh, next door in, in, in an hour or two, and Edward Albee and I were going to be together talking about our our relationship, both as writers and me as a director of his work, and he fell this morning, so he couldn't come. Um, but Edward is one of my heroes. He also taught me that when you're a playwright, you have the power to make your work in your own vision. And I think so often playwrights don't know the power they have. Um, he told me um, when he was first uh, going to the first rehearsal of Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf in New York, uh, his then producer Richard Barr said, you just remember everyone in this room is here because of you, because you wrote this play. And he said it suddenly gave him breath and confidence. All these people are here because they believe in what you put on that page. The producers are here, the money was raised, the actors have said yes, and the designers have said yes, that's why. And so you have to keep fast, hold fast to your vision. And so when I worked with him, one of the things he taught me is everything down to the last prop and detail, he wants to approve. Now it can drive you absolutely nuts, and it is at all, so you have to listen to him. Um, but he, he's also usually right. Um, and I just thought that's a good thing to be saying to a group of, of fellow writers, that we have to believe in ourselves, and the Dramas Guild gives you the tools to do so, and all you have to do is fulfill the rights that are given to you in the, in the minimum basic agreement of the Dramas Guild. You get to have casting approval, you get to have design approval, etc. Et so I would say, I could go on, I could go on and on, so maybe I should stop. Um, Any directors? That oh. Sort of one director that you could... Kazan. You know, it's interesting, he's so out of fashion with all of, you know, <laughs> conceptual <laughs> artists and auteur directors and everything else. What I love about Kazan is he believed in writers and he believed in finding in, and he believed in actors. And that was, if, when he was doing his best work, on some level he was invisible. And like, you, you can always tell if it's directed by him because the actors are doing the performances of their lives. And the plays work. I mean, he made Williams cut. He made, you know, Miller work. I mean, he, he, Kazan. Kazan, great. Um, tell me a story, if you would, from your childhood. Oh, no. That, or not. That explains who you are as an artist and why you do what you do. Anything? If it's too personal, we can move to the question. What a cool question. Uh, I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm sort of. You ask me all these key things that I never ask myself. I feel like I want to be therapy. It's Rose. fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, you may or may not know the people in this house that have done a lot of work in what I call theater testimony or documentary theater. Um, and that's taking the lives of real people and often the words of real people and making theater out of them so that I'm basically a channel to get their work out with the actors who take those words out to you and to you, the audience. And I can tell you how it happened. That was question three, so this is terrific. Oh, okay. Um, it's not exactly my childhood, but the older I get, the more I feel like I was a child in college. <laughs> so, uh, there I was at 20-something, and my father was um, an American historian at the University of Chicago. And I remember coming home from a Christmas vacation um, sort of idly thinking, you know, how can I basically avoid um, writing this awful paper for school? And I was sitting at his desk, and he had these stacks <coughs> of, of uh, vanilla folders. And uh, vanilla folders. And I opened one, and it looked like I was looking at a play. But what it was was the first interview in a series from the American Jewish Committee on survivors of the Holocaust. My father had been asked to be head of that, but he felt that it should not be, um, these, these interviews should not be conducted by professional historians, but rather from relatives or best of friends, so that these interviews would go very, very deep. And so this one, you know, it read, you know, stage direction. I'm sitting in my mother's kitchen on the Upper West Side, the year and the date and the time, and it's cold and all of this, and you can suddenly see these women in your head. Um, 
and she talked about you know how, the ages of each. And her mother, it turned out, was a um, one of the uh, principal ballerinas for the Czech National Opera uh, uh, Ballet. And um, the daughter said, "I've never been able to ask you this, um, but I know that." You're the only survivor in our family, that all your sisters and brothers died, your parents died, and I want to know how you survived. And she said, she would tell her because of this setup, um, that she remembers being on the bunks where everyone was like skeletons and a lot of people she knew weren't going to make it through the night. And she would think in her mind, she said, of a moment of perfect beauty. And she would picture it in her mind. It was her, you know, and her tutu and you know, a, a beautiful shaft of light with this gorgeous man touching her just, you know, at the small of her back as she perfected this turn. And she said that's what kept her alive. Mm -hmm. And I just thought it was one of the most beautiful interviews or conversations between a mother and a daughter I'd ever seen in my life. And so I asked my father if I could use this as the basis of a, you know, as, as a one-act play. I mean, I would edit it a bit and put it on stage. And he said, no. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, oh, really, why? He said, because actually it belongs to the young woman who made that interview and has going into the archives. Um, and he went out that day and bought me a tape recorder mm -hmm. and said, you do your own. And that was the beginning for me of a of all my plays. Great, that was lovely. Um, so maybe we can talk a little bit about adapting text. So you adapt text as a playwright, and you also adapt text as a director, mm -hmm. right? So I'm just curious, well, is that not right? I'm not sure where the line is on this one. OK, great. Yeah. So I was thinking of creating plays, like theater of testimony plays, where you're taking text and you're, you're literally uh, reusing other text. And then there's times as a director where you're um, sort of redoing a Chekhov play, or um, maybe not just even reimagining it directorially, but also changing the text. And so I was wondering if you can just talk about um, what about that process is exciting mm. to you. Well, it's interesting because I, I guess um, at times I, I think of myself as a theater maker, and I don't say, oh, now I'm directing and now I'm writing, especially if I'm doing something like that. But, but I do think, for example, Having Our Say is an adaptation of the book of Having Our Say, but it's a, if you looked at the book of Having Our Say, you probably wouldn't have made the play I made as writers. Um, and then as the director on that, I just felt I would figure out how they were cooking, how they, you know, so I, I I put up both hats when I was writing, but I don't know what the difference is between writing and directing when you're doing an adaptation like that. It's a whole vision. But I could have just written it and handed it over to a director who could have directed it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Whereas a director couldn't have taken that book and done the play I did. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So is there anything that, so what sort of jazzes you about that, retransforming a story? Oh. I think that first story I told you about that Czech woman, I mean, I, it's very hard if you meet extraordinary people in your life. And I just seem to do that over and over again. I would love to give to an audience the incredible experience I had meeting someone extraordinary. So, or if I've heard this incredible story that actually happened, I would like to share that story and how can I make that an exciting event as an audience member. So I'm using all, all neurons are firing of you know the theatrical part of my brain to see how to make that happen. But it's because usually my plays that I write or adapt, or whatever you want to call it, um, something about that story has changed my life. Whether it's the person has changed my life or the story they've told me about other people have changed my life. But for example, the Delaney sisters changed my life. Um, meeting the, the three people in still life. Those people changed my life. And I wanted you to have the experience I had because it was so illuminating. Um, I'm curious, in, um, 
in Greensboro, Requiem, were you able to, and I should have done more research here, so here where I'm not Terry Gross, I don't have a team of researchers, <laughs> but I'm just curious, um, there must be just a huge reaction in the communities where these plays are done, and could you talk a little bit about maybe some of the effect that, that creating um, theater testimony has, I guess yeah. it's sort of maybe healing or Definitely. bringing that process to the community? Well, that's interesting when you bring up Greensboro Requiem, um, asking this question. Actually, when anyone here does um, documentary work uh, and brings it to the communities or the people that it's about, I'm sure you know what I'm talking about, but it is transformative. Um, with Greensboro Requiem, it was about the 1979 massacre in Greensboro of uh, a multiracial group of anti-Ku Klux Klan demonstrators. Uh, the Klan came armed and shot them. Uh, five were killed, countless others wounded, and they destroyed a whole black, um, housing project. And it was a clear case um, of first degree murder, um, but the Klan was acquitted. This is and 1979. this is 1979. You know, you thought it was 1935, but it wasn't. And so um, I met those survivors and learned a great deal from them. I also met a lot of people in the community. When we first did it at the Princeton, at the McCarter Theater of Princeton, a lot of the uh, folks from Greensboro, they, they hired two buses and they came up in droves and it was just so beautiful to watch them watch um, this play. Um, but two other things happened that come when you tell other people's stories as truthfully as you can and they're impactful. One was, in that busload coming up from North Carolina was the woman who had been mayor of Greensboro and she realized she'd never known the real story before because the newspapers had made it sound as if it was a shootout between two you know, extreme groups of crazy people. Um, that was one thing. She then went back and because Desmond Tutu was one of her idols and she knew him when he was um, teaching here in Washington one year, he said, why don't you make Greensboro the site of the first Truth and Reconciliation Commission in America? <laughs> and you know what? They did it. And so the mayor actually and the survivors credit the play for being the, you know, the, the impetus for this. It was extraordinary. I also had a town meeting um, when a University of North Carolina, Greensboro, did the play. And there was a big event um, for people in the town and, and a member of the Klan did come and, um, as well as many of the community leaders and people who had been deeply hurt and wounded by this event. And um, they talked about it. And the, it was covered on, on local television that perhaps the questions of race had not been properly addressed in the town that everyone wanted to believe because this is where the, you know, the civil rights, uh, that they were really the cradle of the civil rights movement, this is where everyone sat in, you know, at the, at the drugstore, had allowed them not to look at what was really going on since the Greensboro police were implicated in a collusion with the plan to, make, to allow this to happen. So it was very, you know, it's very rewarding work. Yeah. 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 Um, can you talk a little bit about the kind of theater that excites you when you go to the theater? Just sort of what, what jazzes you when, when you see stuff on stage? Well, it's, it's a really good question. I, I feel that more than anything, I'm, I'm most excited to have what, uh, Athel Fugard is a, is, a, is a dear friend of mine, and he one time, um, said that his idea of entertainment was the interplay between heart and head. So it's not that I don't love wildly funny contentless stuff that just makes me laugh my head off and makes me want to you know, dance in my seat. I love all that. But when I think about a place that just blow my mind and I need to see and I, and I crave seeing at least once or twice a year, I would say I would, I'm with Apple in that. If it's too much just the heart and it's, it turns a uh, sentimental or treacly on me, I'm not so interested. If it's just the head, I'm not so interested. But the interplay 
is, I think, where I live and what I love to see. Great. So just turning towards um, how you mentor young theater artists, um, uh, you went to Harvard undergraduate, and then did you go to graduate school, or was it the Guthrie training program? Or it was the uh, Bush Fellowship, um, which was the Guthrie Theater and the University of Minnesota Fellowship, yeah, in directing. Great. So I was wondering if you could comment about what you think the importance of uh, graduate school is for today's artists. Um, it's a big question, I know, for people that so might be here. Big. I am so conflicted on this. For Part of what we do at McCarter, as I think I told you when we first started talking, was that um, we have a very, very intense internship program. And so now after 21 years, I've had two uh, a year in directing and in in also artistic direction. Um, we have the literary uh, group, and then we mentor a whole group of, of young, young playwrights. Now, I would say when you come out of our year, you probably know what you want to get from graduate school. And some people realize what they need to be doing is just working. And they can save themselves, you know, <laughs> six figures and, and really get in, working in the profession. Um, until Yale and a few other places gave up their horribly high price tag and now have gotten <coughs> school for free for people, I would say the best thing about graduate school from the students I know and have been mentoring over the years is that you begin to find that group that you'll probably spend the rest of your life working with. I mean, it's a really good place to meet your peers. That they always say is number one, not the teaching, but that. And number two, that your work gets done. So if you're a playwright, um, at the best programs, you'll hear your work frequently, you'll have a production a year sometimes or every other year. That can also be fantastic. And you know, so there's pros and cons. I don't feel I went to graduate school. The University of Minnesota at that time, I mean, I was lucky that I got um, this fellowship so it was free for me. Um, and I actually got a stipend, so I don't have any bills to pay at the end. I was a teaching assistant for my director, and I was also in his class, and that was very odd. And finally, he just said, oh, you know, why don't you just go over to the Guthrie, which I did. And so they gave me, while I was still in graduate school, they gave me my first professional gig as, you know, doing a one act at the first year of Guthrie II. Um, and I learned by doing. I watched the great writers um, who came to the theater and watched how they worked. I watched the great directors. I was in the room, I was stage managing, I was a gopher. I mean, really old school paying your dues. And then every year I would try to apprentice myself to either a master director or a playwright and just shadow them. It wasn't called mentoring then and it wasn't called internships then, um, but it was called apprenticing. And that's how, really, I think, how I, how I learned. And I also stayed out of New York a long time so that I could fail. Because I think you have to be able to fail. You have to take big risks and have a lot of, a lot of shows that don't work. So you find out what does. I think failure is really important. And, it sh and you also find out if you've got the strength to stay in the theater because they're going to kill you at least half the time. And you have to know how to pick yourself back up and go to the next thing. So I'm very ambivalent about, about graduate school. If you know why you're going and what you want and you can afford it, that's one thing. Um, and you'll know what you want to get out of it. If you feel you can do it by doing and watching, observing and doing your own work, I think either works depending on your personality and, and situation. Great, I'm gonna ask one more question and then I'm gonna let you guys ask some. Um, and this is a hard one, but if you could change one thing about the American theater, what would it be? Just one. I'm so angry. <laughs> it can be a long thing. I'm gonna say one word that just sounds so, it's hard for, artists to talk about critics. But I think the American theater has been held hostage to 
the one voice of the New York Times that allows people's work to be entered into the national and international repertoire and allows um, the careers of playwrights, directors, and actors, and designers um, to thrive or be stopped. Now, there are those people who have made their, they realize that you know, there's this one guy or these two guys don't get me, and so I'm gonna build my, my body of work in another place. I'm one of those people. <clears throat> they don't get me, I don't get them. And I have built, I know, a life in the theater where I can thrive. Um, and I go in every once in a while, and I do my Broadway stuff, and I do my, you know, but I love working in my own theater and the theater of my colleagues around the country. Um, if I could change anything in American theater, I would say these are two very bright men who can write well. They are too much alike, in my opinion, these guys in the Times. I would like to see a really exciting, critical um, mass so that people who disagree with each other, so that putting on a play is an event and people take it seriously and they debate with each other. It's not thumbs up, thumbs down. It's grappling with the, the work on a deep and, and sophisticated level. If I could change one thing, it would be that. And as I say, I don't blame the guys, but no one should have that kind of power. It's a form of cultural fascism that should be stopped. Sure. Um, yes, we have sort of had a run in the last uh, three years of, uh, of work, and they're, and they're new. Um, this year, uh, Sleeping Beauty Waves um, with Groove Lily, um, and before it was with Weidman, Shire, and, and Malpe, uh, Take Flight. Basically, how we choose the seasons has to do with both balance and the budget, but mostly with passion. That is, who is at a point in their work um, where they need us, that's one, or that there's a director looking at a, or another artist looking at um, an established work of art that they feel now is important to do and they have a burning passion and need to do it. So we don't just ever pick titles. It's, a, it's, a, it's an artist-driven uh, theater and the, and the choices are artist-driven. Um, with um, with the Sleeping Beauty Wakes, the, the creators were ready. Um, well, not quite ready, I shouldn't say that. The last lab that we had, where we had said previously, we, we, we um, took them on board <coughs> four years ago. And each year we would come in and we would do developmental work, depending again on, on budget and time. And then this last, the, 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 the season before last, I said, you know, I want to give them a deadline and tell them <coughs> we're producing it, and I'm going to give them a series of markers that they have to meet. And it just helped them finish. It just helped them get there. And I just saw potential in the piece. It was it's serendipity in, in some ways. And with um, Weidman and, and Mulvey and Shire, there's a relationship there that we have. And this was a piece that it just frustrated them, and I, I heard a reading of it, and I thought there's gorgeous stuff in it, and I thought they had to solve their book. Um, and so it felt right to do it, because they also kept every reading was, you know, they were building. So I can't say, well, we have a policy about doing more musicals. It's just that that group had it together, just like Chris Durang's commission is ready, and so we're doing it next season. You know, it's, it's, it's all about how the artists are are coming to us in the West State. Great. 
Uh, right here in front. I, uh, I'm a playwright <coughs> that has directed some, so I kind of understand that linkage. Early in my career, I spent four years as the assistant to an artistic director. Uh -huh. I'm a lot harder pressed for that linkage from playwright to artistic director because AD has so <coughs> much long-term strategic thinking and, and so much more life of the institution thinking. It's such a bigger picture. How did you find the guts to make that <coughs> leap? Um, it was, well, at first he's the mother of invention. I just absolutely knew if I didn't run my own theater, I wouldn't get to put on the plays that I believed in. I, either as a playwright or a director, but certainly as a woman in the field who's, um, people don't like to talk about it, and I know why, because we were told that we were shrill and we were difficult, and we were impossible <laughs> in the 80s, but I'm gonna be shrill and difficult. Women have not found parody in the theater, and certainly, they have something they want to say that matters and might get people a little uncomfortable. And so I wanted to have a safe haven because I'm in a place where there's the, you know, when I got there, Shirley Tillman was not president of Princeton University. I never thought I'd live to see the day there was a president of Princeton University, but I did. And that community seemed to like a smart woman who wanted to challenge them intellectually, emotionally, and politically. And I was in the right place, I thought. I love, I, I just feel I have the best job in the American theater, I'm so lucky. As I have a great audience, and they want to be challenged. Great, um, uh, right there in the black, sure. Yeah, it's you, yeah. I'm sorry, I, I actually didn't finish. <coughs> I just realized what you actually asked me. The artistic director playwright, because I'm a writer, I'm a very hands-on artistic director with the writers, because often they come to the theater because they want me to be there to collaborate with. Gotcha. Okay. Great, yes. Uh, I want to respond to what you were you said about the two gentlemen at the New York Times. <laughs> uh, I'm a theater reviewer, and I'm also... Gilbert. Uh, can you stand yeah. up? Yeah. Can you stand up? Drama Disc and Out of Critic Circle, and last year I was on the Drama Disc nominating committee. Hmm. So I would just say that I think most of us reviewers and critics, the news is that it's not, in fact, the New York Times anymore, and that uh, a lot of shows, if they're good shows, there's a lot of other places where the reviews could be positive, and the New York Times just doesn't count in it anymore that much, especially, especially given the proliferation of online sites mm -hmm. that are really taking the, the lead in many ways now. And I think, is it, could you say that those two gentlemen have no power anymore? No, I wouldn't say that. But certainly they have nowhere near the stranglehold they had even a few years ago. So I don't think that's the good news. Up to a point, that's true. Um, I know exactly what you're saying. However, if you're looking at certain venues, that is, if you look at Broadway and you have a show out of town, if you get a bad review out of town from the New York Times, it's, it's unlikely you will come into New York, or you'll have to go to London, or you have to go to LA, or you have to go to Chicago, whatever it is. You are dead for that move because of the producers who feel they can't, fa they can't um, fight the Times. Um, if you were already in the city and you're opening, um, what seems to be the new word of mouth is, um, a great review is no longer a guarantee from the Times that you will run. Um, it's still pretty hard to beat if it's bad. But if you have the opposite coming from John Lahr or from Terry Teachout or, or a couple of other places, Wall Street Journal or, or The New Yorker, sometimes you can beat it, but not often long enough. A lot of it has to do with the producer's putting too much stock in the Times. I'm not sure it's the audiences as much. Um, but I can tell you from running a, a not-for-profit theater dedicated to new work, um, when the Times is even tepid or is anything but an out-and-out -out rave, we, we're stymied in terms of the next step. Great. Um, I'm going to 
Yeah, and just for playwrights, I mean, we make a living on, on our plays going to different places. And if you get, you know, if you're done in New York and it with a bad review in the New York Times, it, it's not going to move. And that means all that money you're not going to get. So. And it isn't just now with these guys. Um, I know in the 80s, I mean, August Wilson and I talked about this. I had a play, mine called Execution of Justice, that went all over the country before it landed on Broadway. And where, where it was, you know, was very successful all over the country and then it was killed on Broadway. And um, I'm just so glad that New York was my last stop, not my first stop. Mm -hmm. oh, great, yeah. Um, I know that McCarter doesn't accept unsolicited scripts, and but you said that um, it's a haven for young artists where you develop. So how, how does that come about? Is that just coming out of school or like how, how do you find those young artists? If it's um, that's a really good question. How, did you all hear it? How do we find the young artists? Um, it's a, partially a problem of um, personnel. You know, we get so many scripts to read, so that's why we have that policy. It's not just, uh, we don't take unsolicited manuscripts. You don't have to have an agent. If you don't have an agent, then someone from the industry whom we deeply respect has to um, say, will you please read this script, and then we will. Um, how we get to young people is it's, again, sometimes it's, it's you know, you can't underestimate luck in, in anyone's life or certainly anyone's career. For example, we, we found Terrell Alvin McCraney because, uh, when he was still a, a first year student at Yale because the woman who was working for us at the time as an associate producer knew him from Chicago. And she finally said, you know, I think it's time for you two to meet. And I think he's finally written a play that you might love. And boy, was she right. <laughs> and that was um, the beginning of the brother-sister plays. And then we eventually you know, premiered the trilogy. And he was a playwright in residence with us. And you know, he, 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 Kamadi Porter was on staff. And she said, I know you'll love him. And she was right. So how do you know how these things happen? Um, Everyone knows that we're out there looking. Um, so people say, I, you know, I just saw this amazing thing downtown. You should read this young man's or young woman's play, and we do. Um, so I don't know if there's, a, I, you know, there's, <laughs> it's not a, you know, a, a ladder. I, you know, I wish it were, we were, we were, could be better organized, but we have an amazing, uh, literary staff, including the interns. And what we do with the young people in the literary office is we make them go out and see the work in storefronts and the work downtown and off, off, and wherever they, you know, they, they, they keep their ears to the, to the ground so they can hear who's, what's happening with their crowd, you know, with their friends, who are they most excited about. And that's, you know, we do everything we can to make it happen. Great, yeah. I love what you said about the inspirational text story and the, the sort of writing that you do. I'm curious to know if um, you think it's possible to, or if you've ever had the experience of enjoying a play that's comprised of unlikable characters doing unlikable things. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Most of the great plays written uh, in the world are unlikable yeah. people doing unlikable things. I happen to like Oedipus Rex, yeah. Um, Richard III. Richard III. Um, <laughs> you know, it's so interesting you asked the question. Do you have anything behind that question, or do you want me to just look here? I may be having a talk back on Monday, uh, and I, I feel like this question could help me. <laughs> <laughs> OK, great. Um, if you're doing talkbacks, I always think it's important that the playwright take control of it. That is, you probably all know about Liz Lerman, right? Um, but you get to ask the audience questions so that it will help you with your work. And they are not there to tell you how to write your play or rewrite your play. Bravo. Okay, you all know this, I'm sure. Um, but I do think the great plays in world literature are often about people, good people and not so good people, doing terrible things. And it just is one of the great themes of all storytelling. 
So this thing about having likable characters, I mean, this comes from often American television development people. <laughs> and that's because they write a lot of things to sell soap, basically. It's, 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 you know, it's to make money and, and sell commercials and all of that. And um, that's not what the theater's about, or shouldn't be what the theater's about. If you want to do a commercial piece of work that is going to make you money and the producers money, sometimes the best way to do that is to make people see something that's really easy to see and makes them happy, and it's good people doing good things. I don't know what play that is, good people doing good <laughs> things to each other. Um, but I certainly would not let anyone uh, tell you that that should not be the subject of your play. Right? <laughs> Great, yeah. When you did the play about Greensboro, how did you get entree to the local people who were complicit at the time? Um, and yeah. What's really interesting when you do work about people who do terrible things and are awful people, um, I uh, had one of the most chilling experiences of my life with the Klansman who said he would be interviewed by me and led the caravan of the other Klansmen to go and kill these people. And why? He felt important. Mm -hmm. And he wanted his story out there. And it was really like having dinner with the devil. I mean, it was so, so scary to look into those eyes, and he was so proud of what he did. There was absolutely no remorse. And he said, you know, I like plays. He said, Do you think this is going to be a movie, too? He said, yeah. So he was just, a lot of people like to talk about themselves. And often people live with themselves having done horrible things because they've justified it in their own ways. And he did, and that's what made it interesting theater for me to make a play about why these guys got away with it for so long. He died, never having spent a year, a, a day in jail. Why got away with it and, um, well, I don't know what I was going to say. But Wasn't it on TV? I mean, they had the, the shootout like the on shootout. TV, right? They yeah. still got away with it, right? Yeah. It's crazy. You look at that just video clip, and there is no way they could possibly get away with it. And it's right there in black and white. And they did. And they did. Okay. But it's such, I, I, by listening carefully to the people who've gone through it and knowing what the outcome was, I learned so much about human nature. I mean, that's why doing documentary work can be so rewarding. It's so rigorous that you, know, you think, well, that couldn't be, or that couldn't be, but then you find out, well, that is what happened. How did that happen? And then you really have to go deep. You know? We have time for one last short question. Who's got a short one? Short. Short, OK. Um, I wanted to ask, um, it's hard enough to get women into the theater, but what about a senior? I'm 77. I've only been in this for 10 years. And I'm winning things, but right. I'm I'm emerging, and I'm afraid I'm going to leave the earth emerging. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to play on my chest. Yes. Where? Oh. What, where do I send? I just finished my. I, you know, I, I have this at the theater. Um, I would grew up being the youngest person in the room, and now I'm the eldest person in the room. No, I am. Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay. In this room, I'm not. Okay, I believe you. Um, but we actually do, I mean, I say young voices and young writers are this. Actually, I, I, I am misspeaking, and I correct the staff all the time about talking about emerging writers, not necessarily young writers. Some people find their voices in their 40s George Bernard Shaw didn't write a play until he was 40. I mean, some people find that later, <coughs> in the 60s, 70s, it happens in poetry, it happens in novels, it happens with, well, with playwrights too. They keep coming. I mean, oh. Well, if you. And I'm writing fast. Uh, <laughs> well, all I can do is, is, is encourage you. 